live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, Jeff Kelly and Jeff Frick. Hi, welcome back. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at Splunk.conf 2014, the fifth annual Splunk user conference. About 4,000 people running around, uh, Splunkers, partners, customers, prospects, uh, journalists, analysts, it's a whole community. Everyone's excited to be here, learn more about the latest from Splunk. Uh, we're the Cube. we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. This is actually our third uh, Splunk.com, so we're excited to be here. It keeps growing, it outgrew the, the Cosmo. We're over at the MGM now, and it, it continues to grow. It's a lot of good vibes, it's a lot of good mojo. Excited uh, about this next segment, and we're joined by my co-host, Jeff Kelly. I'm Jeff Kelly from Wikibon, and we're joined by Paul Walbeck, who's a freelance writer and blogger out of Australia. Uh, I think our second or third Australian guest we've had on the Cube. <laughs> we have got quite a bit. Paul, welcome to the Cube. Thank you, Jeff. Pleasure to be here. Um, so, why don't we start with, tell us what brought you to Splunk.com? What attracted you to this show? Well, I've been writing a lot on big data, Internet of Things, uh, those topics, and really, companies like Splunk are really making a difference there on how businesses use that. One of the areas I write on a lot is how businesses are developing in the new economy, mm -hmm. and that's um, and this is one of the tools that they need. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we uh, you know, Wikibon, where I work, we cover big data, you know, very closely, and mm. clearly the way organizations use data now and going into the future is going to be really one of the key competitive differentiators. It's how you leverage your data assets. Every company is a data company to some extent. Um, absolutely right. So, yeah, talk a little bit about, you know, the vibe you're getting here, um, and what's impressed you most, most with Splunk? What I've been really impressed by has been the community that they've got, um, both amongst the users and amongst their partners as well. That's um, one of the things I'm noticing coming to a lot of these conferences is that uh, it's that partner ecosystem that's really making the difference for a lot of these companies now. So the more partners that are there, leveraging the services they've got, uh, that's what I think is the real key um, mm -hmm. for success for a lot of these technology companies mm -hmm. now. So, talk a little bit about um, kind of what you've been, what you've seen as you chronicle the you know kind of the new economy. What are, what are some of the examples of uh, companies that are really leveraging data to to, to, a, to to positive effect for their organization? Well, one of the ones I've been particularly interested in over the last year or two has been GE, the way that they're mm. doing things and um, uh, really pulling in that industrial data. And again, here at Splunk, I mean, this is a big emphasis on that industrial data that's coming into the systems. Um, during the keynote yesterday, they had Coca-Cola as a good example of that, and uh, mm -hmm. as a global, corp those two global corporations with a huge amount of data coming in there, and uh, industrial partners, and for Coca-Cola, the consumer market, that's, um, this is, those are good examples of yeah. really big data, deep data, that uh, you can be pulling some really good insights out of. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about machine data, when you're talking about data coming off aircrafts, and absolutely, we've, we've had uh, folks on from uh, locomotive companies, and I mean, that's, that is truly big data when you think about the scale, mm. the velocity of that data, um, and, and the impact. I mean, we talk, Jeff Immel from GE talks about just making a 1% improvement in, in efficiency in something like an aircraft engine can save you millions or billions of dollars. That's right. So, um, again, I, I think what would be interesting to get your perspective on is um, coming from Australia, what, what is the, what is the uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the thinking down under about uh, big data, and how does that maybe differ from what you've seen in other parts of the world, and do you feel like um, in Australia that's that's a concept that's kind of uh, taken hold that people really understand, or is it still pretty early days? It's uh, largely on the desk still, though, and some of the big um, global companies, so particularly the mining companies, and again here, um, lots of mention of uh, the, the mining companies with uh, their um, driverless trains, that sort of thing, mm. uh, deep data there. but. Australia, um, it's a pretty safe um, place to do business at the moment. Um, didn't really get hit by the uh, global crisis mm -hmm. in 2008, so um, so it's a little bit complacent on this, I find. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, talking to US companies, East Asian companies, European companies, they're a lot more on board with this um, and probably much much more ahead. Yeah, well, one of the things, one of the big topics, of course, of this show is security. Um, and mm. it seems like every other day there's a new security breach in the, in the, in the business yes. press, whether it's JP Morgan, or Home Depot, um, and security strikes me as clearly one of those killer apps, if you will, for something mm. that for a company like Splunk that can take a more analytics 
style approach to security than kind of that old school monitoring and reporting style. Uh, what's your take on the security challenges we're seeing out there and, and the role big data might play in uh, addressing some of those challenges? Well, I think one of the interesting things with Splunk, I'm looking at some of the demonstrations on that, so when we look at that target hack, that uh, the security software was alerting the sysops that there was a problem, but because they were overwhelmed apparently with the logs that were, log files that were coming in, they, uh, they disregarded that information. So having that information in a much more visual way, I think probably is going to help avoid those future sort of problems there. And getting that real time thing. So in the, um, in the security keynote yesterday where um, the statistic being thrown around is 233 days of, uh, that a hacker is in your system, or sorry, the bad guys are in your system. Uh, that's a, that is a real challenge that uh, having that visual data is going to help a lot. Yeah, I think uh, you hit on a couple of good points there, and one being the real-time capabilities and also, Jeff, of course, the visualizations. Um, communicating that in a way that people can, can understand. And yeah, the other really scary stat that came out of that thing was the 100% of the breaches were, were done with, with uh, legit credentials. I thought that, Absolutely. One, that one kind of popped <laughs> off the screen to me. So give us a little bit of, of kind of the, the tech industry vibe uh, right now in Australia. Just kind of for an update for our, for our audience. You know, we know Atlassian, right, they're real big. Obviously yep. in San Francisco, eventually they'll go public, you know, after they got their big chunk of money from, from Excel. Uh, so that's a great success story. Um, there's a lot of little companies we hear about, like the one that it was Google Maps, right? I think it was a New well, Zealand right. company, right? So give us kind of an update on what's going on and kind of the, the state of the union for, uh, for tech industry in Australia. Well, tech industry in Australia is in an interesting position at the moment. It is getting some, uh, some drive for the same reasons around the rest of the world, that there's a lot of money sloshing around these um, VC and seed funds. I mean, I mean, startups are always moaning that they can't get funding, but there is money out there. Yeah, that and these days there's a lot of money flowing. <laughs> That's right. 50 million, 30 million, 60 million. Exactly. Australia though is in a funny position because um, we've had some strange things happen with our tax laws that actually penalise the startups. So what we're seeing like Atlassian is a very good example. That, uh, they're looking at an IPO down the track and they're not going to do it in Australia. They're going to do it in London. So uh, and part of the reason. London? Yeah. Not, um, not, uh, not New York. No, that's, uh, well this is an interesting thing with us, the Australian startups, that um, you can split them into three different groups. Um, the biggest group are looking at coming to the US, so uh, coming to, mainly to the Bay Area. Then you've got a group that um, are looking at uh, Europe, and that's mainly because of the historic ties with England and that sort of thing, so right. uh, they're comfortable with that. And then there's the other ones that are looking at East Asia, which are an interesting bunch. So um, things like social media analytics company I was looking at recently, uh, that what they're looking at um, is helping out franchise chains in the Philippines and Singapore and so on. And Indonesia's got a big mobile um, market there, so quite a few of the Aussie startups are looking at what they can do in the Indonesian market. So that's the real focus there. And then on, like the, on the big data side and the industrial internet side, like you said, G's really driving the, driving the train there and, and, mm. and clearly the mining industry is a tremendous uh, mm. right part of the Australian economy, really feeding the Chinese factory, if you will, right? Absolutely. With, uh, with, with Australian natural resources. So wh where would you say the adoption curve is, you know, kind of relative to a lag, kind of the early leaders mm. out here? They, pretty close, are we a global economy? Is there still a little bit of a lag there? I'd say there's a bit of a lag. Um, I'd say three to five years. In fact, I was talking recently to a, a, a fairly cynical seed investor in Australia that was saying that um, he likes to um, invest in copycat businesses. So uh, someone will come over and uh, see what the big thing is, you know, say it's an Uber uh, knockoff or a Groupon knockoff or right, whatever. Right. And invest in an Australian knockoff of it with the idea that um, the market's three to five years behind, so they can make out like bandits for three to five years, and then when the big guys finally get round to setting up, then they sell out to them or pack up the tent and move yeah, on to something does else. Does it work for them? Uh, it's a bit of a crapshoot for them. Uh, for some of them it does, uh, for others, but hell, that's early stage investing for you. Right. <laughs> so, so if they're three to five years behind, what's the hot topic right now? What are you writing about most? What are people commenting about most? What's in the newspapers? Well, the main things that I'm writing about is the Internet of Things, because uh, this, is a big th this is big right across the world. Um, in fact, I was at a conference last year in, um, in Europe on the Internet of Things, and uh, the biggest group there were Chinese journalists. and. Uh, China, as you pointed out, is the big export market for Australia, and the Chinese really want accountability through the supply chain. So again, that comes into the Splunk um, side of things as well, being able to analyze that. But uh, that is the big issue at the moment, the, the big things. And what about the security? Because obviously, um, with China, you know, there's some, some security concerns. And, yep, and, absolutely. Uh, and clearly there's been history there with, with, uh, with, with intellectual property laws, et cetera. Mm. Um, how's that playing? 
In, in Australia, it's fairly relaxed on that. They, um, they, they don't take it as seriously as they do here. In Australia, the focus is more on stopping Aussies from uh, pirating videos and so on, because this is one area that we are very much behind, that uh, we don't have a Netflix stand under, uh, Netflix don't operate there. They and, should have uh, invested in the, in the Netflix, uh, well, the, the Australian Netflix. Uh, well, it's a weird thing in Australia that the rights, um, all the rights get taken up by the free-to-air TV stations, so uh, the networks grab them and then don't show them. So you get something like, say, um, the Sopranos will get shown at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night this week and uh, 2 a.m. on a Thursday uh, morning the following week. And they'll put them out of order too and show them three years after they went to air in the US. So there's a big, there's a big pirating culture in Australia for exactly this reason, that uh, you're not going to wait um, two years to see The Walking Dead or whatever. <laughs> so. Who knew? Uh. <laughs> So the, so the other thing right with Australia that is unique, and we had the, the flying doctor service on, sure. the service is yeah. big, right? And there, mm. you actually, I don't think, you, there's no road still across the middle of Australia, if I, if I understand, right? You got to go a little four wheel drive, a little dirt. So you've got distributed populations, you've got the, with the southeast coast, you've got something way over on the, mm. on the west side. So how is that being impacted by some of these technology changes? Well, this is what uh, this is where we see a lot of hope for that regional areas because uh, Australia, the population is pretty concentrated in the Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, southeast corner there, and uh, not a lot of people outside of it. So that's where the Royal Flying Doctor comes in for medical services for that because right. you need a plane to get around these things. We did try to launch a national broadband network that uh, would connect every connect those smaller communities up. To it. That's sort of fallen apart at the moment. That was a big political hot potato, right? It was a big political hot potato. I think that was going on when I was there a few years back. Oh, it's still going on. <laughs> it's, um, in fact, I've sworn I'm never writing about it again. It, uh, <laughs> it irritates me that deeply. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we, this is the sort of thing that we're hoping that that's going to reinvigorate the regional communities and uh, get more jobs and get more people living out there. And then what about some of the bigger companies like Splunk and, and, and GE? Um, in their presence in, in Australia, is there, you know, we, we go to all these conferences, we're spoiled, we're in Vegas all the time, we're in Moscone all the time, there's mm. a lot of great buzz right now. What's going on there in terms of that? It, you know, is, is, the, is the population being invigorated or does everybody just fly over here, it's a short flight to, uh, to LAX and then hop over to, to Vegas? So it's a relative, yeah. short, relative that's short a relative term. I guess yeah. we're going to the moon, that's, <laughs> 14 hours. that's a short flight. Yeah, just a short 14 hours. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, a tricky, um, it's a tricky question because I, I find most of the Australian market is, um, we didn't get hit by the global crisis, so um, they're pretty relaxed about things and um, property prices keep going up, so we're still flipping houses to each other. Um, it's, we're partying like it's 2007 in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the biggest surprise you've seen here at this show? What, 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 what uh, did you not expect? Didn't expect the uh, level of um, engagement amongst the um, partners there. Uh, when I was uh, originally looking at it, I was thinking uh, it's going to be a pretty dour system, operators and all that. But it's a really enthusiastic, um, interesting um, uh, group of ecosystem of um, developers, applications, and customers. Right, which which we which we've seen now. You pretty much need that ecosystem. You know, all, pretty much all mm. modern software companies have a thriving ecosystem as they move to a platform. They get other people developing uh, applications for them, and you know, it's this aggressive fight for the developers. You know, how do we get the developers? That's right. That Steve Ballmer developer, developer, developer thing, and uh, having those open APIs is is the key to success in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. So I give you the last word before we have to sign off. Uh, what should people know about what's going on in Australia? Uh, well, we're here, we need more tourists. <laughs> Let's, uh, come on down, enjoy the beaches and the beer. <laughs> Especially in the winter time, right? Because it's e summer in Australia, if you forgot. E exactly right. All right, Paul. <laughs> well, thanks for stopping by the Cubes. Good to get uh, international perspective on what's going on. My pleasure. So, thanks again. Uh, so, Jeff Frick here with Jeff Kelly. We're at Splunk.com 2014. This is the Cube. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, try to get you perspectives that you might not otherwise have, bring you the information, bring you the, uh, the insight. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break.
Cube is a live mobile studio. And we bring it to events and we say we extract the signal from the noise. What we do is we get the absolute best guests that are at those events, we bring them inside the Cube, and we talk to them, we have a conversation. We really want to make it fun, exciting, but more importantly, extract the data from the guests and extract that metadata and share it with the world so people can use that information to better themselves, better their companies, more importantly, connect with other people to do more business, to define more about the technology. And for us, this is the future. Uh, I watch many of the uh, the CUBE interviews when you're handling other events. Oh, good. And, uh, you know, it's both the combination of enjoyable and insightful. And, it, you know, what I like is the uh, interactive banter back and forth, plus the fact that, uh, you know, when I think about some of the conversations we have, they're not only deep, they're not only rich, but the audience themselves will really come to benefit from those conversations. When organizations bring the Cube to an event, it just brings a whole new dimension. It adds a texture of not only independence, but also explodes content from their community into a much, much broader community. We tend to reach about 10 times the audience that's live at an event. So we're a big data-driven organization. Um, we have a data science team that allows us to see not only what's uh, trending broadly uh, with the public, but what's tre trending in very specific areas in our specialty in tech. Uh, that allows us to vector our analysis and, and relevance uh, from our research and journalist team into everything that we do as a media company. And really the benefit of theCUBE is a place for conversations, for people to connect with each other and, and to learn about things. And uh, it's a revolution in, in media. We look at the technology and the people behind it as tech athletes. Those are the folks making the companies, making the technology, really creating the new value in this modern era. And it's fun, it's exciting, and more importantly, it's very social. The Cube does an excellent job of taking a very, very, this very, very broad platform and format and giving visibility to a very broad audience on each of the different uh, key aspects of the technology. And it's a, it's a great environment for the, the broader community who couldn't be here today have visibility into what we're doing, what each of the tracks are, and what are the sort of the core trends that are associated inside of Hadoop and given a very balanced view from multiple dimensions around it. And I think that's invaluable for the community. We always know that your view is right until you hear a different perspective. So you're always interested in, give me some neutral perspective, help me see it from a different uh, light, right? And maybe ask a hard question or two that I might not have considered. And, you know, in that sense, right, that independent right, uh, uh, voice, that uh, always ability to, right, have, uh, you know, sort of in independent, audited sort of perspective, right, of the world, it's always just good. So these guys bring an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge from their own careers. They've been into a lot of different things in the industry. And uh, they're independent, you know, they're able to bring different points of view. And, you know, sometimes they ask really tough questions, too, the kinds of questions that maybe you don't want to answer. And so, uh, but it always gets to the heart of it, and we just love having them here. It's about connecting with people, and that really is what it's all about. Having the conversations in a very social, collaborative way, and that's what makes it so exciting. And people are watching. I think it's extremely valuable, also, the, the independent parts, right? So they're, so they're not biased by having a... Uh, a sponsored kind of relationship for the specific segment, so that there is no, it essentially leads to a kind of more of an unbiased conversation, and also leads to like kind of like the no questions were left unasked. Any question can be asked because I'm not going to ask you the question that might look you bad or might make you look good. The value of an independent news organization at an event is that it allows our audience to have a perspective that's balanced. That it's not just you know the vendors talking to them. It's the community, it's analysts, it's technologists, it's customers, practitioners. So they get a full perspective that's unfiltered. Well, the thing is, you know, you need a unbiased view. And, and even though we're in the middle of the EMC forum and the EMC event, it's clear that this team has a view across the landscape competitively beyond EMC. So for people looking in to hear from, you know, un unbiased hosts like that and be able to ask the tough questions, the probing question I think is valuable to, to all the people in the technology space. Um, I, I, I want folks out there to understand the depth of technical inspection that goes on with, with you guys. It's, uh, it's deeper than you know, most analysts we talk to, right? I mean, so we roll up our sleeves. We'll spend a half a day on a hot new technology instead of the you know, PowerPoint I believe that goes on you know, a lot of the time in our industry. So it's, uh, you know, it's, 
when you get a perspective from the cube, that is, uh, you know, that's as good as a validation. So the cube has been called the ESPN of tech, and really our vision is to cover every event that's out there. We really, truly want to be a global organization that is at every event, extracting the signal from the noise, being on the ground, giving our audience a sense of what's happening at that event, but also providing analysis and insight worldwide, literally, for every event that's out there. So the Cube has been called the ESPN of tech, and really our vision is to cover every event that's out there. We really, truly want to be a global organization that is at every event, extracting the signal from the noise, being on the ground, giving our audience a sense of what's happening at that event, but also providing analysis and insight worldwide, literally, for every event that's out there. I like the format a lot. I think it gives us, uh, I mean, it's really rapid fire, which is kind of fun, right? Uh, we're all high energy people, so it's a great chance to just sort of get into it and uh, get excited about it. So it was fun. It was very good. Very interactive, but it's always good because uh, this is what you face with clients all the time. They ask you tough questions. It's not under the camera. That's the difference. <laughs> but, I, but I definitely enjoyed it. You know, I have been on the Cube for a while. I think I was there the first edition, and uh, it started with being this small thing that John had the idea on, and, and David was there, and, and Jeff, and so forth. And I think now we've turned into like an amazing production. When we go look for guests for our events that we cover, we want to look for people who are the thought leaders, the CEOs, the people making the news, people who are shaping the opinions of the crowd, and more importantly, people who have something to share that's valuable that we think could be added value to, to our audience in the crowd. John and Dave were prepared, and uh, multiple cameras, lots of lights. As far as I know, you could hear me. There weren't any breakups or like that, so it was good. It's been fun to watch it develop. Um, it seemed like it was a table and one camera, and now it's a whole production room, and uh, it's pretty important. And I think it's an important source of information now. There's a lot of people that can't make it to conferences, but they know that the Cube's available to, to you know, find out the news of the day and, and uh, see the ESPN sportscasters of big data. Uh, love the format. Love the format. Yeah, Dave's a pro, and uh, it's a great chance to come and actually talk about what's really coming new in technology. One of the things I like about the Cube, and it's fun for me, is I like to ask the questions uh, around other things, not necessarily the messaging of what they're trying to say. And guests have a lot of information that we want to share, so I like to go in and try to explore uh, what's in their mind and extract that from them and share that with the audience. So sometimes I have to ask around about questions, uh, kind of tease out some uh, market trends. More importantly, get them off their messaging because the audience loves to hear uh, what these people think and how they feel about things. Because it is a longer interview. It's sometimes 15 to 20 minutes. And we want to get at the action. We want to get about what's on their mind, what's inside their head, and get that out into the social world. This is a fantastic way to have the conversation with guys who know what's going on, 
uh, who can, you know, kind of scratch below the surface, who can, you know, respond to what's happening right now on, you know, a, a Twitter feed about maybe some technology that's new in the marketplace and respond and have a conversation. So these guys bring an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge from their own careers. They've been into a lot of different things in the industry. And uh, they're independent, you know, they're able to bring different points of view. And, you know, sometimes they ask really tough questions, too, the kinds of questions that maybe you don't want to answer. And so, uh, but it always gets to the heart of it, and we just love having them here. Well, I think the Cube, you guys always have very thoughtful questions, really insightful comments, and it actually makes for a really fun discussion. The thing that I really like about the Cube is, you guys get it. I mean, bottom line is we can talk about high-level strategy, we can talk about execution, we can talk about competitive and market. And it, you know, what I like is the uh, interactive banter back and forth, plus the fact that uh, you know, when I think about some of the conversations we have, they're not only deep, they're not only rich, but the audience themselves will really come to benefit from those conversations. I mean, these guys are great. Um, I think this is a revolutionary forum. Uh, up till a few years ago, I'd never seen this in my entire career. Uh, these guys are great interviewers. They're spot on, they're sharp, they're funny to work with, and uh, they just ask great questions. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be on the queue. It's really great. What's so neat about it is it's like real time discussions and also just being able to have people share their views simultaneously. So I'm, I love it. I think it's really fun. It's a great way to you know, get the message out and to have a dialogue. I, I want folks out there to understand the depth of technical inspection that goes on with, with you guys. It's, uh, it's deeper than you know, most analysts we talk to, right? I mean, so we roll up our sleeves. We'll spend a half a day on a hot new technology instead of the you know, PowerPoint I bleed that goes on you know, a lot of the time in our industry. So it's, uh, you know, it's, when you get a perspective from the queue, that is, uh, you know, that's as good as a validation.